Alright, and welcome to my Code Vein level 1 guided walkthrough in which I'm going to take you step by step through the main game of Code Vein without leveling up, going solo with the exception of the Blade Bearer and Cannoneer fight, and melee only, so no ranged attacks. Now, contrary to my no leveling guides for Dark Souls and Bloodborne, this walkthrough is not based on extensive experience. In the From Software games I had done no leveling playthroughs to the higher New Game Plus cycles before I even made those guides, but given that Code Vein is a rather new game, this recording is for my first time playing with an unleveled character, and only my second proper full playthrough. So that means I had to improvise and experiment my way through the game, but even though I made mistakes, left valuable items behind initially, chose the wrong weapon transformation, or even at some point the wrong weapon, and I very likely did not use the optimal setups and strategies, but fortunately that does mean that you can learn from my mistakes. And if it's still viable to complete the game at level 1 without the optimal setup, then you will stand even a better chance at survival than I did. So this does entail that sometimes it will be better to do as I say, rather than as I do. However, first things first. Contrary to Souls games, your character level only affects your HP, stamina and damage output, and doesn't place any restrictions on what weapons and equipment you can use. Meaning that any weapon is an option, even on level 1. However, there are optimal weapons for level 1 in each weapon class, based on weight, attack rate and, most importantly, base damage. Now I only focus on two of the weapon classes. Primarily I use a one-handed sword, and my secondary weapon is from the Halberd class, specifically the spear. Now the main reason to choose a one-handed sword as your primary weapon is low stamina consumption. It is very easy to run out of stamina in this game, even on the regular playthrough. So on level 1, this game demands some extreme stamina management. The spear is primarily for against regular enemies, because of its stagger potential. Lots of enemies can be stunlocked with this weapon, whereas the one-handed sword can only do this with weak enemies. It also has a very powerful attack when you press R1 and square at the same time, which can knock enemies down, although this does depend on enemy type, animation and focus state. Its stamina consumption is higher than a one-handed sword of course, but less than a two-handed sword, even though relatively speaking at least, there is little difference in damage output compared to those. So which weapon specifically is the most effective in each class? My main weapon is the Sunset Sword, and I would argue that this is the optimal weapon for a level 1 character. So if you're familiar with Soul Level 1 in Dark Souls, this is basically this game's equivalent to the Reinforced Club. You can acquire it immediately after the first boss fight, it has a really fast attack rate, high base damage, and it gets a damage boost from Gift Transformation, which is the optimal transformation choice for level 1, as you will rely on buffs for your damage output, and given that this transformation removes scaling, it wouldn't even get increased damage from leveling up anyway. Now there is an alternative, the Hanamakuro, which initially looks like the better option, because it has a higher damage output, but it has a slower attack rate due to it having a different combo animation, and for this weapon, the damage decreases from Gift Transformation. So eventually, the Sunset Sword will simply outclass this weapon. Now another sword that you will see me using after the successor of the claw fight is her weapon, namely the Blazing Claw. That's a mistake however. There is no real benefit to this sword, other than the fact that it looks really cool. Yeah, it's not bad, but it's not great either. When it comes to spears, there are only two options, or in your case, maybe only one. Because I wasn't initially even aware that the Cerulean Spear was a pre-order bonus. So it might not be available for you. In which case, the alternative would be the Impaler. Same moveset, same stun locking potential, but it does have a lower damage output than the Cerulean Spear. I don't have much experience with two-handed swords, hammers and bayonets, but I wouldn't recommend the first two classes due to high stamina consumption. However, the Swyander will allow you to block enemy attacks. You can also find it early in the game, it has high base damage and it also gets a damage boost from gift transformation. From what I heard, on a regular playthrough, using the Swyander is essentially easy mode meaning that it also might be viable on level 1 as well. However, keep in mind that a single hit from the Zwyander is pretty much the equivalent of only two fast hits from the Sunset Sword. However, if you want to make a single hit really count and have the option to block, then this might be a viable weapon and a late game replacement would then be the Lost Zwyander, given that it has higher base damage. I have almost no experience with bayonets and I'm not using ranged attacks anyway. However, they do have extremely low stamina consumption, are lightweight, and the Lost Bayonet has high base damage, and it seems that it's essentially the Bayonet equivalent to the Sunset Sword. So I wouldn't be surprised if that would be a very effective weapon for a level 1 character. When it comes to Blood Veils, you might be out of luck again, because my Blood Veil of choice also turned out to be a pre-order bonus, namely the Vanish Claw. 
or however you pronounce that. Purely based on its low weight, well, also fashion of course, but because of its low weight, you will have quick mobility, at least when using the Sunset Sword, and I find that extremely helpful. No other early accessible Bloodville will give you quick mobility though. The earliest one is one that you find in the Cathedral, but only after using a transformation to reduce its weight. Fortunately though, there is a gift called Hasten that gives you quick mobility regardless of weight. And once we have Final Journey available, which is an extremely powerful attack boost, when it's active you will automatically gain quick mobility regardless of what weight you have. When it comes to blood codes and gifts, well there are so many variables that there might be all kinds of builds that I'm not even aware of. But from my own experience and from what I've seen from other people, the best choice initially is the Prometheus code and then the Queen Slayer after defeating the Queen's Knight. That's the code I'm using until the end of the game. Alright then, let's get started with the actual playthrough. Now for the sake of time, I will either compile the important pickups in each area, or I will show you the correct route to take while avoiding enemies, as many areas are pretty much like a maze. Now in case of the tutorial area, the game will be practically the same as on a regular playthrough. Do make sure to pick up the Queen's Irons though, as you will want to upgrade your weapon as quickly as possible. Remember, we are going to pick that one up pretty much after the first boss fight. Also of course the regeneration upgrade. In fact, pretty much pick up anything you see, because we also need exchange materials. And despite not leveling up, we do need a lot of haste as well, because some of the gifts are pretty expensive. Now as you know, the first boss, Oliver Collins, will practically be defeated for you, as Lewis will automatically join the fight. On new game, this fight cannot be done solo. Moreover, his transformed version is literally a regular enemy in the earlier parts of the game, with the exact same moveset. The only difference is that the regular enemies can be backstabbed. However, if you wonder what this moveset is exactly, and what it's like to fight him solo, I will show you some footage from New Game Plus. But as you will see, he's basically just a regular enemy and a warm-up for the rest of the game. Alright, so let's get started with the actual playthrough. Get the Prometheus code from Lewis, and if possible, the Vanus Claw so you have quick mobility. Purchase the Blade Dance skill. This is a very helpful gift as it increases your damage with each consecutive hit. In fact, it's the most powerful buff for early game, especially with a fast hitting weapon like the Sunset Sword, that we will pick up very soon. But before we do that, we need to unpartner with Lewis as we're going solo. So sit down with him and tell him the bad news. Yeah, he's a great guy, but you see him more as a friend than as a partner. Back in the city, you see an NPC from who you can buy exchange materials if necessary. However, initially, we only need 10 trading points. However, keep it in mind, just in case. After the next bond missile, we encounter a few regular enemies, and these guys drop the Sunset Sword. And it's a common drop, so it won't take that long. There's also Queen Iron to the left, and a Vestige to the right. In fact, the Vestiges in this area are going to be very important.
Once you have the Sunset Sword, make a quick trip back to base to upgrade it. Now you could also already transform it, but that will cost 10,000 haze, and that's a lot for early game. Moreover, I initially did not go for the gift transformation, and the chrome for which you can purchase from IO with 10 exchange points. But instead I went for the venom transformation, the chrome for which you purchase also for 10 points from the guy that gives you access to the devs. You could say that this was a mistake, and in sort of a way it is, but for early game this is actually a really helpful transformation. Because almost all bosses and enemies can be poisoned, and the fast attacks from the Sunset Sword will apply the effect very quickly. Also equip the stamina boost from the Ranger Code. It's a passive gift that you can practically use for the entire game. After all you will have way lower stamina than on a regular playthrough. The Adrenaline boost from the Fighter Code is a rather weak boost, but it does last for a long time, and it stacks with your other buffs. Now as a general rule to keep in mind, if you're ever short on Awake modules, Remember that there's an easy way to acquire a gift from a blood coat that you don't have equipped. If you go back to the first area of the game, equip that blood coat and just make several rounds through the cave killing all the weak enemies, that will max out the proficiency rather quickly. Regardless you will find quite a bit of awake modules in the world itself, and they can randomly drop from enemies. Regardless just keep in mind if you don't have enough, and you don't know where to find the specific ones, a little bit of grinding in the first area will guarantee access to whatever gift you've purchased. Of course, some gifts require vestiges, so for the first area we need to pick up all the Prometheus vestiges. Also Hunter vestiges and of course Queen Iron. Now for the sake of time and the fact that you would already be familiar with this area, I will only summarize the important pickups. I will go into more detail for the later areas to show you the exact routes and how to deal with or completely avoid enemies, but this area will almost be the same on level 1 as on a regular playthrough. On your way to the next bond missile you will find a Queen Iron on the right side, and just before the garage, we find our next vestige. Also, the huge boob lady will likely drop another Queen Iron. After the cutscene, activate the missile, and as you know, this is one of the few non-linear parts of the game, as we can head towards the butterfly boss or the howling pit. Here you can see a map of the area from the Faxo Life wiki. First up there's an awake module, and in this location you will also have the first encounter with those annoying rat uh, kicking enemies. So make sure that you can face him one on one, and throwing daggers can be useful to lure enemies towards you. Remember, because you're solo and low level, you will want to minimize facing multiple enemies at the same time. And speaking of which, near the ambush section you find Hunter Vestage Part C, and around the corner you find the regeneration upgrade. In the bottom left corner of the map you find another Queen Iron and Hunter's Vestige Part B. Even though we're not going to fight the Butterfly as our second boss, that's the direction we will head in first, and we will find another Awake module along the way. Of course be careful of the ambush of the enemies hanging over the edge, and don't forget Prometheus Vestige Part C. And then we can open up the shortcut back to the bomb missile. Now there is another hunter vestige hidden right before the shortcut, which I initially forgot. So I came back for it way later in the playthrough. Now having said that, the gift it gives you access to, namely a passive boost in strength and uh, dexterity, is very useful, but not when you have your weapon transformed with the gift transformation, as it will no longer scale. So how useful it will be for you depends on how soon you transform your weapon with an EOS Chrome from IO. However, if you as well go for Venom initially, it provides a nice damage boost, which I initially unfortunately had to do without. So now we have the shortcut open, we can easily continue towards the Butterfly boss, because we do want to pick up some items along the way, namely another Awake module, and the Zweihander if you're interested. The next vestige is on the very edge of the spike, but make sure that you first run past the enemies, and with a bit of luck you won't have to face shooting enemies together with the giant boob lady, because that will be a bit of a clusterfuck. Sorry, Louis. I 
Right before the stairs is the Nightclaw Blood Veil, if you're interested. Especially handy if you don't have access to the Venice Claw that I'm wearing. After going up the stairs, around the corner is another Queen Iron. And then we can activate the next Bond Missile. After that there's a vestige next to the statue, you know the one where we gain access to the cathedral later on in the game. And right before the boss, at the end of the path on the right side, we have our final Prometheus vestige. Now even though we could already fight the butterfly boss, that would not be a smart move as we can get our weapon to plus 4 and can acquire some useful gifts if we go to blight, I mean if we go to the howling pit area first. So instead warp back to the parking garage and go to the bottom right side of the map. Right before you drop down, there's another queen iron. Alright, just like me, you probably felt completely lost here in the Blight Pit area. But actually, you can progress by simply going practically straight ahead from the first bomb missile. However, we definitely want the Assassin Vestige Core on the left side of this area. Moreover, as annoying as this area may be, these enemies give a relatively large amount of haste for early game. And we can get around a 20% damage boost if we acquire the one-handed sword mastery gift early on. It costs 36,000 haste, so it does require a bit of grinding. But my advice is to simply do it, because you will be happy that you did. And with the blood code that you acquire by talking to the lady from uh, which you buy items back at base, we can also acquire the lightning weapon buff. So after all of that is done, it's just straight ahead to the next bomb missile. And in that area you will also find an atlas vestige. That's not the most useful blood code for level 1, and I don't use it at all. However, it does have a gift particular to that code called Firm Stand that can prevent you from getting one-shotted. However, it is tied to that blood code, you cannot transfer it. So I didn't use it in this playthrough. But if you encounter a boss that you cannot defeat without taking damage, it is something to keep in mind. Now in order to progress to the boss of this area, we need a few keys and the first one is almost impossible to miss. Take out the large enemy and you encounter the lever for which you need that key immediately after that. No idea why you need a key for a lever, but whatever. The next one is near that blue exploding enemy, however you don't need to kill it. You can just grab the key and make a run for it. Past the gate, take the right path first, as that is where you find the moss covered key. Then go back and take the left path. On the platform you find a chest containing the prayer soul, which is already upgraded to plus 3. That's not a good choice if you don't have the Venice Claw. Moreover, it becomes a great veil for late game, because even though light gift scaling doesn't affect weapon buffs, there's one exception, and this blood veil has high light gift scaling. Before the next lever is not a queen iron if you need it, but past the lever we encounter our first queen steel, and we will find a second one later on, which allows us to upgrade our weapon to plus 4. Watch out for hidden enemies hanging from the ledges in this area. And hidden in a corner you find a chest containing the Hanamakuro, which is already upgraded to plus 3. And at this point in the game, it will outclass the Sunset Sword. So you might want to simply use it temporarily. However, if you do that, and have traded for a Venom transformation, use it on this weapon, and then later on use a Gift transformation on the Sunset Sword. When you come to a fork in the road, take the right path, and on the platform you encounter the next missile.
In that same area is a chest containing the already upgraded Impaler, the alternative to the Cerulean Spear. It's guarded by those annoying spiky balls, just keep in mind that they bounce up first before they charge you and you can't stun them during that animation. So wait for them to bounce up, dodge and then stun like them to death. Even though I already purchased the overdrive gift from the assassin blood code, I did not take the time to grind to max out its proficiency. But this is actually a great skill to acquire as soon as possible, because it gives a great damage boost that's active until you take a hit, and you often die in one hit anyway on level 1. And speaking of times when you normally would heal, I advise you to buy stamina boosters to use instead of healing items during boss fights. So at the start of a boss fight or at times that you would normally use to heal are a good opportunity to give your small stamina bar a little boost. Right before the boss area we find our second queen steel. So definitely make sure to upgrade to plus 4 before actually fighting the boss. Now you wouldn't expect a boss in a poison area to be susceptible to poison, but she is. Now something I only discovered late in this playthrough is that you can also use a venom buff item on a venom infused weapon, which applies the poison effect extremely quickly. And as you know, you can attack a boss before the life bar appears and they take almost no damage before they get a chance to attack themselves, however you can already poison them. Moreover, it's also a great way to charge the blade dance gift, as it increases your damage output with each consecutive attack. However the first attempt doesn't begin like that. Her first move in this case is her AoE that spawns underneath you, so dodge away when she raises her hand as it glows red. As long as you stick close to her, she will almost never do that move. Her overhead attack is slow and well telegraphed, so easy to dodge. Be careful though that it reaches way farther than you might think. For her regular attacks that quite often result in a free hit combo, but can also be a single attack, just move away from her. Dodge backwards, not through her attack. Sidestep her kick, quick attack so a fast reaction is required. And when she staggers, attack until your stamina is depleted and then activate the Phantom Assault Gift, since that works even when you have no stamina left. When she starts her second phase, move to the very edge of the arena. That way you are out of the reach of her water attacks. Although you only have a split second to determine which side, depending on how far she moved away from the center of the arena. Close in, but not too close, as she will likely do a slide move, and it requires very strict timing. And she can also do it twice. Then close in. This time when she steps or staff into the ground, immediately move backwards to avoid her pole dancing attack. And the same principle still applies to her combos. It is rare, but she actually has an alternative pole dancing attack, where she suddenly jumps forward. So don't close in too quickly. She also has a free hit combo that ends in a slow delayed attack and it's very easy to take a hit due to dodging too quickly because of the delay. So you can dodge through it as I did, but to be fair I don't recommend even trying. Moving backwards from her combos is a much safer option. Alright we immediately continue with the next boss fight and it's a pretty difficult one. Not merely because of the poison, but also because it's hard to differentiate between each move and your vision often gets blocked, which is a common design flaw in this game. You can charge the blade dance attack by immediately attacking her when she shields herself, but don't get greedy of course and get caught in the poison explosion. Now general rule for this entire fight, dodge into her, not sideways, including the poison projectiles, dodge forward. In a first phase, the second attack from a sideways 2 head combo will automatically miss you that way. Now this here is a most dangerous move, because it's extremely difficult to see it coming, since it looks like that same 2 hit combo. However when her tail head points forward, she will charge forward, so then you do need to dodge twice. And you only have a split second to recognize that attack. In this fight she actually went to second phase before her life bar was halfway down, and from now on when she does that same charge attack, she follows up with a spin, so don't close in immediately after dodging. When she staggers, same principle as before, if you happen to run out of stamina, activate the Phantom Assault to keep your attack going. 
Now things get really annoying because she can fire a projectile that follows you around. You can outmaneuver it by moving sideways, but since dodging forward is practically always the best to avoid her attacks, including when she dashes forward as she leaves a poison trail behind her, that projectile can really easily throw you off. She can also shoot several smaller projectiles, but fortunately those do not track you. Her two-hit combo can now end in a spinning attack, so then you do need to dodge twice, but you can also do the regular version. Again, to emphasize, the main difficulty of this boss is that it's simply very hard to recognize exactly what she's doing. And here you can see that she can even delay the spin in her 2 head combo. When she sprays a giant poison cloud, simply stay back until it dissipates. And to be Captain Obvious, make sure to have Anti-Venom ready. And the most general rule in this type of game, don't get greedy, especially not near the end of the fight, because that almost got me killed. After the cutscene at the start of the next area, you automatically get the vestige required for the flame weapon buff. Contrary to a Souls game, you can actually stack elemental buffs. So even though visually it looks like only one element is active, you can apply both lightning and flame and get a damage boost from both. In fact, you can even use all elemental buffs simultaneously. As far as I'm aware, any weapon buff can stack. So as long as you have enough Icor, you don't even have to choose. Now regarding this area, I'm simply going to run through it as there is little of value to pick up. I did intentionally pick up two awake modules and some random stuff due to my lack of experience and therefore lack of familiarity with the location of each item. But remember that awake modules are essentially time savers. They are not required, they merely prevent you from having to max out the proficiency of a gift by grinding enemies. Also as you can see, having quick mobility really comes in handy when running through areas while evading enemies. So if you don't have access to the Venice Claw Blood Veil, I advise you to invest in the Hasten Gift from the Prometheus Blood Coat, which temporarily gives you quick mobility. There are also speed booster items that you can purchase from the shop back at base, but for some reason I actually hardly ever use them in this playthrough. Remember that you don't need haste for levels, so you have a lot to spare for buying tons of items. The insatiable despot is one of the easier fights in the game, but only as long as you can prevent him from spawning minions. So immediately at the start, target the crystal to prevent this from happening. In the first phase, general rule is to stay between his legs so his attacks will go over you, or to be directly behind him. So always close in when he moves away from you. However, be careful that when you close in, he can do this really fast overhead stab attack. You only get a split second to dodge forward when he does that. 
If you use poison and he isn't poisoned yet when he goes into second phase, you can actually keep attacking to build up the poison, which is unrelated to him taking reduced damage. Moreover, if he's already poisoned, that damage won't get reduced when switching phases. Now, directly behind him isn't safe anymore because he can spin, but between his legs is still safe. One exception though is when he does a charged overhead attack where his weapon glows red. That attack causes an explosion so that will hit you. Basically that's the only attack that you explicitly need to look out for and dodge away from him. Before entering the cathedral, make sure to either purchase the Cerulean Spear, if you have the pre-ordered edition like me, or use the Impaler instead, which we've picked up in the Howling Pit. Two hits from these weapons will stagger the majority of enemies, meaning that you can basically stun like them to death. Definitely not with a 100% success rate, as their focus state and the animation they are in, they play a part as well, but remember that the difficulty will significantly increase from this area onwards, so you will have to rely on strategy a bit more. After passing the first enemy in this area, we can pick up a regeneration upgrade, but you will soon notice that running out of healing items on level 1 is a rather rare occurrence. There are going to be a lot of one hit deaths, so prepare for that. So more importantly is to find upgrade materials for our weapons and blood veil. And yes, upgrading your blood veil is in fact important, even though we're only using melee attacks, because backstab damage is dependent on your blood veil and not on your weapon. I'm not yet going to farm enemies in this area, but the very first one you see can be farmed for queen steel. So in principle you could upgrade your sword, spear and blood veil to plus 6 before even going through the rest of this area. But fortunately there's also quite a bit of queen steel you will find on the ground. So I personally choose to leave upgrading for later on. Now this entire area is an absolute nightmare in regards to figuring out where to go. So the main purpose here is to show you the optimal route to take. Well, sort of at least. So other than cutting out when I die, you will also notice some strange cuts here and there due to me going the wrong way. And I will also speed up the footage now and then. When it comes to fighting the new enemies in this area, the most effective method is to hit them twice with the spear, causing them to stagger. If you wait a brief moment to let a bit of stamina regenerate, and then hit them twice again before they have a chance to attack, that way you can basically stun lock them. However, to emphasize again, this doesn't always work, because when they enter focus state, you cannot stagger them on the second hit anymore, and some attack animations will continue even on the second hit. But it is at least very helpful to keep in mind as a general strategy. You can even create an opening by moving away from them, which causing them to do their teleport move. If you dodge that, you can get a free attack in and get the stun locking going. And of course, remember that Icor is not really a finite source, since you get it back from attacking. So if you stack 4 buffs at once, the spear becomes very powerful. Now as you've noticed I've picked up a chrome and I'm going to use it to infuse my spear with lightning. Elemental transformations are a bit complicated in this game as it adds a fixed amount of damage but I have no idea exactly how it's calculated. Without scaling, which is applicable to level 1 of course, it increases the general damage output but it lessens the effectiveness of elemental buffs. I assume this has something to do with stacking buffs having diminished returns or something. However, Gift Transformation removes all scaling, increases the base damage, depending on the weapon by the way, and increases the effectiveness of Gifts altogether. So my assumption would be that there is almost no downside to use Gift Transformation early on in the game. But on the other hand, I suppose that it's a good thing that I didn't actually do that in this playthrough until late in the game, so you can see how effective Elemental and Poison Transformations are in comparison. Of course, as you would expect, the effectiveness of elemental damage varies from enemy to enemy. Some are weak to one and resistant to another. By the way, as I've mentioned before, the overdrive gift from the Assassin Blood Code is one you should make sure to have at this point. However, I didn't bother to max out its proficiency yet and instead waited until I got the right amount of awake modules. Which is not a smart move. It's better to spend some extra time to max out a gift's proficiency. And again, this can be done rather simply by equipping the blood code in question and making a few rounds through the cave at the start of the game, and then you don't even have to worry about awake modules at all. Now, you may have noticed that I'm not making good use of items yet. After returning from the memory where we defeat the Queen's Knight, you will see me using the camouflage items that you can buy back at base. Especially together with the sound suppressor, those are extremely helpful to run through areas. 
although they don't last that long, so you will need to reply them at the right time. Fortunately they are cheap and the further you get into the game, the more haste you have to spare anyway. Other than that, there is unfortunately not that much I can say about this area. I can only show you the correct route to take, as this is a very lengthy and completely confusing maze. It really sucks that as far as level design is concerned, the, the game designers kind of dropped the ball in my opinion. Basically all areas are annoying mazes consisting of narrow corridors or walkways where you wander around aimlessly. So it may not make for a very exciting video, but I hope that if you try to find your way through this area, this will make it a bit easier for you to get from A to B. When using the spear, pressing R1 and square at the same time not only does a more powerful attack, it will also knock an enemy down instead of staggering them. The vast majority of enemies can be hit even when they are on the ground, so that means you can get some free hits in before they can stand up again. Definitely make sure not to fight two teleporting enemies at the same time. Stay out of the line of sight of one and draw the attention of the other. If you have throwing daggers, those can help to draw an enemy out of a group as well. I've mentioned the Hasten gift before, not only is this helpful to get quick mobility if you don't have the Venice Claw, but even when you have it, the spear is heavier than the Sunset Sword, so it can even be helpful in that regard. It does cost 10 Ikers, so I didn't end up using it that much, but when you try to outrun enemies rather than killing them, 
It is something to keep in mind. Unfortunately, due to the teleporting enemies in this area, running past everything is kind of hard to pull off to begin with. You definitely need camouflage items for that. Over here you find one of the ISIS vestiges, which impacts which ending you get. That's something I wasn't really concerned with, so I didn't bother saving the successors with the exception of Nicola, who turns into the successor of the breath. Because when you do so, you will get this blood code, which gives you access to the ice weapon buff. And most late game bosses are weak to ice. But as far as I can tell, the other successors don't give you anything that is specifically helpful for a level 1 melee build. Over here on the left there's a very powerful enemy that drops a regeneration upgrade. Although he can be stunned like the teleporting enemies, he can also recover very quickly. So my advice is to be patient and get as many backstabs in as possible. Because even with your buffs active, he has an incredible amount of health and he will likely kill you in one hit. The path to the next missile is uh, rather lengthy, even at double speed, but it's also very straightforward and you can't really take a wrong turn. But I will leave it in, in case you want to skip it, I reach the next missile around the 48 minute mark.
All right, it took a while, but we are now in the final section before entering the player's memory. But we have to unlock several doors before we can fight the boss guarding the entry to our memories. By the way, this missile here is a great farming spot, because there's a teleporting enemy close by with a fairly high drop rate for Queen Steel. So after unlocking the pathway to the boss, it would be smart to farm that enemy until you have upgraded both your weapons and especially your blood veil. Because the upcoming boss is the only one that can be backstabbed, which is dependent upon your blood veil. And in case you need to max out the proficiency of a gift, you can kill two birds with one stone while farming this enemy. Unfortunately, I don't have that much patience, so I did not in fact upgrade everything to plus six. And I also still haven't maxed out the proficiency of the overdrive gift. So uh, as I said at the beginning, it may be better to do as I say and not as I do. This initially looks like a dead end, but we have to go up the ladder and drop down this side of the tower. In fact, all those doors leading up to the boss don't even need to be unlocked. Only the first and the last one. Because as you know, the run back to this boss is uh, kinda terrible. However, there's a relatively easy route to take from the missile to the boss, which only requires you to take out two teleporting enemies along the way. So after unlocking the path, I will show you again how to have the easiest run back from the missile back to the boss. Alright, as I've said at the beginning, if you don't have the pre-order edition, there is no blood veil available until late game that grants you quick mobility, unless you use a lightweight bayonet. However, down here, where you also unlock the map, is one blood veil that could give you quick mobility as long as you reduce its weight through transformation. But whether you want to do that is up to you. An alternative is of course the hasten ability, but that costs 10 Iker, meaning less weapon buffs. Moreover, once we defeat the Queen's Knight, we gain access to Final Journey, one of the most powerful buffs in the game. And that one automatically grants you quick mobility. And ironically, as helpful as quick mobility can be, it can unfortunately also screw you over. In fact, I almost died near the end of the upcoming boss fight, because he has these wide-reaching swing attacks, and my dodge animation is short and quick. So in the course of the game, uh, you will probably experience multiple times that you dodge an attack but still take a hit because the hitbox is active longer than your entire dodge animation. In fact, due to the insane tracking and general speed of this game, it's not even uncommon to dodge right in front of a boss's attack. 
So at least against the upcoming boss, it might actually be better to be able to dodge by rolling instead of quick stepping. Okay, so now we have cleared the path from the missile all the way to the boss. So now let me show you the easiest way to get from that missile to the boss arena. Because if you go in a straight line, you have a lot of enemies to deal with, including a high likelihood that the final two teleporting enemies will attack you at the same time. So it's way easier to simply take the longer way around. Alright, the Argent Wolf Berserker is the only boss in the game that can be backstabbed. And you can in principle chain backstab him constantly. However, as you have undoubtedly noticed yourself, uh, the backstab is not very consistent in this game. Sometimes you are directly behind an enemy and it doesn't work. And sometimes you are clearly not directly behind him and it does work. In my experience it often helps if you press and hold the square button rather than a quick tap. But just don't solely rely on backstabs but get some normal attacks in, especially when he's standing up. The elemental buffs have no effect on backstabs, but the blade dance gift increases your overall damage output. And an interesting mechanic in this fight is that you can actually prevent him from getting into second phase if you backstab him while he is shifting phases. And finally, as I've said before, his attacks are these wide sweeps, so especially when you have quick mobility, it is possible to dodge his attack initially, but still be within the hitbox. So that kinda sucks. But that will unfortunately happen a lot in this game. Especially when you consider how insane the tracking can be and the hit detection is also sometimes a bit uh, meh. Anyway, that's the end of part 1. In the next episode we will continue into the player's memory and we're actually going to switch from the Prometheus blood code to the Queenslayer code. If you enjoyed this video consider leaving a like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, check out my other videos and of course stay tuned for the next episode.